seen a great, uh, a, you know, a great opportunity in um, specifically in uh, uh, China. So, but nevertheless, I think, uh, well, I came across at that time Jinko Solar. It was an unknown uh, upstream manufacturing solar business. Uh, and uh, once actually I started with, uh, actually with first time when I approached them, they said, you need to send us uh, a CV in Chinese. It was just in the beginning and I was like, what is it? You know, why, why do you need it in Chinese? And I kind of passed it on uh, looking for other companies and uh, solar sector at that time, I have uh, decided to go after solar uh, photovoltaic uh, industry. Uh, where I didn't have the um, actually the industry background, but uh, CABS has given me an opportunity to change not only the function, but also the industry. In fact, I, I felt that I was more prepped for that. And actually maybe three year, three months later, I came back to Jinko and I decided to take a chance. It was an unknown uh, manufacturer uh, upstream. Uh, one year after I joined them, we went public in the US. Uh, and actually, I think 2015 will have become the largest uh, PV uh, module manufacturer in the world and held this crown for five years. I ended up working for Jinko for 12 years, uh, first three years in China, and it was fantastic uh, because I got to know everything. I was the first foreigner, in fact, to be hired by Jinko. And then uh, after three years in China, I moved to, um, to Europe, to Italy, uh, to continue with the company. Uh, and just recently, actually, I uh, joined, uh, I left uh, Jinko and I joined uh, another uh, solar module manufacturer who is uh, right now a number one company in the world in uh, uh, the role um, covering Europe. Okay, so and between the two transitions, actually, I lived uh, three different experiences, which I would uh, I'd be happy to share with you. Number one, working for a Chinese company in China. Number two, working for a Chinese company outside, but knowing that Chinese company very well and coming back to that all the time, to the headquarters. And number three, which I'm experiencing right now, working for a new Chinese company and not being able to go back to China in order to accelerate my integration. So, and there are very, uh, three very different experiences. Definitely I have preferences as to how I would want it to be if I could choose. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Gulnara. Um, yeah, lots of questions to ask you uh, about that going on. Uh, Diego, maybe let's uh, let's come to you next. Great. Can you hear me well, James? Loud and clear. Very good. Hi, guys. Uh, so I'm, I'm I'm Diego. I come from from Spain, and uh, I started my career in uh, PNG in uh, Procter and Gamble in 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 London, um, looking at their consumer. Uh, products business uh, in the region and it was, it was a really interesting time um, was during the financial crisis so I was working in the finance team trying to optimize all of our marketing uh, marketing spend uh, but I think that that was also a time where Europe was not growing very fast where there was not that many um, sort of exciting opportunities and, and I was really keen to move to a, a region where where this was happening where technology was was growing and, and where a lot of innovation was possible and um, China was my, my go-to uh, country for that. Uh, and a, a bit like Gulnara in the sense that, that I use Seeds as, as my uh, platform to, to move to China. In fact, I, I had never been uh, to the country before my first day um, at the MBA. Um, so, so it was really fantastic opportunity to do that. I think um, during the MBA, I, I, I was part of the student committee organizing um, uh, social events. That was my, my job. Uh, and, you know, after three months joining the MBA, I was organizing a uh, party in the Shanghai River with 400 people in a big boat that was owned by a state-owned enterprise from China, having to negotiate in Shanghainese, which I obviously didn't do, but some of my fantastic classmates helped me with um, and then to really try to, to take advantage of the, of the platform that, that Seeds is, right, uh, with the fantastic alumni network that we have. I, I did an internship um, in the consulting uh, team that the Bayer Pharmaceutical Company has in, in Shanghai covering APAC. Um, did also some of these consulting projects that, that uh, Marianne was, was mentioning about. And then um, went to uh, went to Alibaba. After that, I, I realized that tech was really the place to be uh, in China, and, and China was the country to be in for for that. And it was an amazing experience. Uh, I was part of the second ever um, cohort um, that that Alibaba was hiring of of uh, internationals to help 
and support on the globalization efforts. Um, we had an alumni from from uh, we have a couple of alumni who've joined this this program from from Siebs. and and it's it's really interesting, right? Because the, the company uh, was was in 2017 and is still now uh, trying to crack how to go global. And I think uh, it's not it's not just Alibaba, right? It's it's also Tencent, it's Meituan, it's it's Didi, it's JD. It's a lot of 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 these uh, companies trying to figure out how to how to globalize, right? And I think it was really great to, to be at Siebs where you could get a, an understanding not only of General Motors and, uh, you know, all the big American companies that figure out uh, a way of how to do globalization, but also see how um, Chinese tech companies were exporting their, their, their growth models to, to other regions. And it was really interesting to, to be at their growth uh, and expansion team uh, doing that. So w- when I joined... Uh, I was working for AliExpress, which is their B2C e-commerce uh, website. Um, and uh, we, 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 we saw Spain as a really growing market. Um, so that was, that was an opportunity for me as, as a Spanish uh, person to, to really help the company um, open up in, 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 my home, in my home grounds. So it, it felt really like, a, like a, a great opportunity to be the bridge between both um, in doing that and then spend also some time in, in Ali Cloud doing a similar thing for, for Southeast Asia uh, and then uh, join Ant Financial uh, first uh, in, a, in Malaysia, opening a, a joint venture um, for an e-wallet that we have there called Touch and Go. Um, and more recently have, uh, have uh, joined a, a, a project with uh, World First, which uh, was a M&A acquisition um, Two years ago from Ant, it's a UK company that does B2B payments. And again, uh, my role there is, is to find synergies in, 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 this, uh, in this acquisition and, and, and create new business opportunities. So I think um, it's, it's, it's been really a great uh, ride of, of at first spending some time in headquarters to really understand the culture of the company, get the network, get to know how budgets are signed off, how products are designed, etc. And then be able to go to global markets to um, to try to make an impact for the company, and I think you know Seeds uh, did save me uh, a lot of time and a lot of mistakes in in doing that. So sorry for the long answer, James. No, that's uh, that's great. Thanks, Diego. Uh, Tina, over to over to you. Hi everyone! Excited to join this panel. I'm Valentina. I'm originally from Russia, and I came to China in 2017 to join. Uh, the MBA program. Prior to that, I was in China only as tourist, and I never lived in China. I actually studied a little bit of Chinese before coming to uh, Siebs. Um, and uh, my career was um, um, pretty, you know, I, I did a few switch uh, before the MBA. So I was uh, at the very beginning of my career, I was a journalist. And then I switched to consulting. I was a business owner and uh, I worked for a consulting company uh, for seven years. Uh, I was taking care of heavy industries such as manufacturing, oil and gas, uh, construction, petrochemistry, uh, so on and so forth. And then uh, I was thinking I wanted a change I wanted uh, a new experience and I ended up at Steve's because I, when I was choosing between business schools, I was looking at, at a place where I can get not only knowledge, but also I thought, okay, I'm going to spend two years of my life living um, somewhere in a different place. So uh, let it be a very unexpected experience, very interesting and uh, to some extent mind-blowing experience. So when I was comparing business schools on the West and uh, comparing all of them to SEEBS, uh, I uh, thought it's a it's, uh, better choice because it's uh, exposure to a very different culture. Uh, and after after my MBA, I joined Castbox. Castbox is obviously not as famous as Alipay, uh, so uh, I'm not sure if all of you know what it is. But it's a platform. It's a podcast app 
we are actually third uh, podcast app in the world behind Apple and Spotify. Uh, we are biggest uh, independent app. And uh, I'm taking care of uh, business development um, and podcasters relations in Europe. And now recently I uh, am taking care of other, uh, our top strategic regions such as, uh, such as North America. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, Tina. And also uh, thank you for um, yeah, uh, braving your call to, to join us uh, online tonight. Um, last but not least, uh, Lawrence, if you could share a little bit about your, your, your journey to China and what you do now. Sure. Yeah, thanks for having me, Jimmy. Um, yeah, so like Diego, I have not been to China before I started my MBA either. I kind of it was a, um, yeah, a cultural clash when I joined um, CIS. Um, but I did it intentionally. I uh, previously worked in the automotive industry at Jaguar Land Rover, um, very much focusing on electric vehicles and battery technology. Um, and if you work in this kind of space, you're somewhat confronted with uh, Chinese companies. And um, it really caught my interest in the Chinese market um, for the automotive industry, very important. And um, this is the main driver for me to go to seats. And then I I went to SEEPS, I did the standard 18 month program. Um, I think most of the MBAs do the 18 month program. They live on campus like myself, um, for the most part, I would say. Um, I had, uh, the, had a scholarship um, and then after I graduated, um, I joined a, um, a Chinese company called CATL. CATL, um, most people in, have not heard about it because it's a B2B company. They are market leader in lithium ion battery technology. And um, it's a fairly young company. They kind of arose out of this whole trend of electrification globally. And um, they do batteries and batteries only. There's uh, some companies that um, yeah, they do other stuff like um, smartphones and washing machines and all sorts of things. But CATL really focuses on innovation and uh, that's the core technology. So for me, this was kind of a natural transition then, um, knowing kind of the battery space, um, learning about China, and then joining a Chinese company afterwards. Um, so there was kind of the, the general context. And yeah, I, I can highly recommend doing it. Um, for me, there was not this kind of radical um, transition of industry. Um, I don't know, this, this sort of triple jump that some people say in the MBA for me, um, that's not applicable, but personally, I didn't want that either. So um, I wanted to stay in this space. And um, yeah, I think Seeps was definitely up for that. Great. Uh, thank you, Lorenz. And thank you, everybody, for your, your introductions. I guess now to kind of get into the, you know, the, the, the meat of the, uh, the discussion, um, I'm careful not to kind of, you know, generalize amongst all Chinese companies going global, but I'd really like to talk about, um, you know, how you all found your, your opportunity at your current or previous uh, Chinese globalizing company. Um, and how you found that opportunity, um, you know, through which platform or through which introduction, and then also about your experience of interviewing, because in the in the audience tonight, some people will be in China, some uh, you know have never been to, to China before, so we've kind of got quite a, a mixed bag. But um, Gulnara, if I can, you know, come back to you on that. So you know how you found the opportunity, and then some maybe one or two kind of general tips for um, impressing an interview. So uh, I think I already briefly mentioned uh, how I found it. However, since it was a new uh, industry for me, and <laughs> I've got uh, right after the MBA, I've got plenty of time because the hiring market was quite uh, cold. So I started uh, studying the new industry and I started actually being in Shanghai. Uh, I started going to the exhibitions and that was fantastic opportunity to see a lot of manufacturers. So you read, you know, the industrial magazines and now with the wealth of uh, information online, it's even easier. And then I would, start, I would start going booth to booth and approach them. And as a foreigner, at least back in the day, I was getting a lot of attention. So, and I was uh, able to get to the highest person in the booth at that time, right? Because they don't know, they may think I'm a, cli I'm a client. 
And uh, in fact, I mean, I uh, that was quite successful also with another company, which I decided not to go for. Uh, I also got my, let's say, my gut foot into the door through that approach, uh, meeting the second person in the company. And uh, they uh, gave me an offer, but I decided to go after Jinko. And um, yeah, with Jinko, as I mentioned, I mean, um, first I met them at the booth. And they asked me for a Chinese CV and I said, you know, why, why is that? Why is Chinese CV? I mean, uh, but they, again, they didn't have the capability yet also uh, to review the English CVs and uh, the owners of the company and still larger shareholders that don't speak English. So then I came back, as I said, um, uh, probably in three months, I, I went back to Jinko. I translated the CV and uh, interviewed uh, together. Also, I interviewed with the chairman. And actually, uh, the fact that at that time, I also studied Chinese. I didn't study Chinese before going to China, but I did during my MBA years. And also, given the time after MBA while looking for a job, I really pushed hard for it. Actually, my um, Mandarin uh, knowledge at that time, which was much better than it is right now, uh, has uh, broken the ice also with the chairman. And in fact, in the uh, 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 consecutive years, I was able to just pop into his office without an assistant or without a translator and just discuss with him the matters. That was fantastic. So that was basically, uh, that was uh, how I did it uh, in the first place. And uh, with the, you know, I think the second, <laughs> the second step after Jinko, and Jinko I held four roles for uh, 12 years. And I was, uh, you know, um, I decided to move on to another company in order to actually take my career path to the next level. But I think for the, uh, our uh, audience, it will be something maybe irrelevant. James, what was the other question? I think uh, there was something that I have not addressed. Just about, I, I guess, kind of uh, the the interview it, itself, or you know, any any tips for, you know, or you know, even how you prepared to speak to the the chairman, for, sure. for example. Sure, sure, sure. So, I mean, you have to think about what uh, I always think about what uh, value I would add. Don't think about me, 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 but what can I do for the company? It's important. And it's not only relevant to the uh, Chinese enterprises, to any enterprise, because uh, when you go into the interview, you want to tell them as to what's in it for them. And uh, myself as a foreigner, uh, I'm also, uh, I'm a compatriot of uh, Valentina, I'm also from Russia originally, uh, having lived in the US before, um, and having worked also with the European companies, et cetera, that was my pitch, right? I'm a foreigner. I actually studied in CIVS. So I also have, let's say, I, I put my uh, feet into the water. I understand to a certain extent, of course, uh, Chinese culture. And that helped a lot also with the company uh, because I was not just a foreigner uh, who are bluntly going straight ahead. You know, the also SIPs uh, taught me a great uh, deal of diplomacy. It was not my best skill. I'm still working on it. So, but it helped a lot with, um, you know, it helped a lot with, uh, with the, um, with this. So uh, that's what I wanted to uh, mention. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Golnara. Uh, Diego, uh, from your side. So how you found the opportunity at Alibaba and then, you know, a bit about the, the interview process or any tips. So I, I applied to 60, 60 companies uh, for a full-time job and most of them didn't really reply me. To be frank, I was copy pasting the same cover letters and stuff from one to the other. I sometimes put the wrong company name uh, in the wrong cover letter. So it's a lot of my fault. But th there are two offers that I got that I really liked. I got three offers that were that were really what I wanted and two that were particularly good. Alibaba and Amazon, both for their, their leadership program. Um, for obvious reasons, I picked Alibaba because I think for, for, for China, they being in Amazon was less part of the of my career uh, track so I mean I, I saw this listing in in the in the um, uh, Siebs uh, jobs portal but I think what what made me get interviewed was the the heart that I put into that right because I didn't do what I usually did I, I actually went out to speak um, to our alumni that work at Alibaba and the the career service of Siebs was very helpful to connect me with some uh, folks in different business units um, of, of Ali, I, I went to visit the campus, I sat with them, I, I, I extracted, you know, from them their view. And this view was very useful, right? Because if you just talk to different employees that you don't really have a connection with, it's, it, it's already good, but, but these people knew what SIBs can really bring to the table. And I think together with them, I was able to understand um, 
what I could bring to the table. And I think that's, that's you know, something that what Kulnaro was mentioning, right? Not, not thinking about you, but thinking about what actually they need from you. And I was quite scared at the beginning because I, I was coming from a slow moving consumer product company. So what can I help there, right? So I think what, what they pick, picked up is that they needed brand um, expertise. They needed brands to join Alibaba. They, were, they, they couldn't continue growing with, you know, some OEM or white label, you know, non-branded commodity products, but they actually needed people that understood how to speak to brands and, and you know, the PNG experience really came in handy. So I tailored my CV and my cover letter towards that. Um, then I also learned that values are very important for this company. So I tried to understand every value that they have and see what stories I could you know, relate from my background or my past to, to, to live and breathe those, those values. So I think the, the, the application that I sent was quality. I think the SIEB stamp probably helped, obviously, right? But, but I think the application was high quality. So, I mean, compared to the other ones I did. But, I mean, the, the, the interview was crazy. Yeah, I've never seen something like that. So they flew, 6,000 people applied for this uh, position. They flew 80 people to Hangzhou. Um, and during three, four days, you were in a constant, you know, limbo of not knowing what was an interview and what wasn't. So the first night they put us up for a big dinner, everyone starts getting drunk. Uh, and at the end of the dinner, they, they show up a slide saying, look, this is a case that we want you to guys to solve. It was, you know, what kind of technology from Alibaba could you leverage to solve a social problem in your home country? And so everyone ran back to their hotel rooms, jet lagged or um, drunk or whatever, and tried to put something together. And you had only 24 hours to do that. Problem was at 9 a.m. you had to do a visit to Hangzhou, to the lake and, and whatever, which obviously no one wanted to do. Everybody wanted to stay um, working on their, on their case. But again, smartly, uh, most people went to the to this city visit because it was actually part of the interview probably because there was Alibaba employees chatting to us right so and then we 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 then uh, reconvened in the afternoon and we were divided into groups of six where there was three managers of alibaba watching you for three hours in your group of six try to come up with a joint proposal right so everyone on the previous night is working on your proposal for your country for the problem so you had to agree on one of the six becoming the, the sort of chosen one uh, and then presenting it jointly to to the panel of managers, right? So this was a social experiment in itself. I mean, imagine some people went crazy trying to be aggressive and being like, no, my idea is the best. Other people were very shy and very quiet. And I think here that, that really tests your values of, you know, being assertive, but also being flexible, et cetera. Um, and, and yeah, I think it was really, really interesting. But I think similar to... To Gulnara, I had tried to practice Chinese. I didn't speak any before MBA, but I, but I did my best to to learn. And again, you may not be able to do a sales pitch in Chinese, but you definitely can break the ice in these conversations, which is uh, very, it's just a game changer, right? So I knew that. I knew the languages. I'd used their apps in 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 China. I had used their competitors' apps. I knew what projects and priorities they had from my conversations with alumni. So I had all the weapons to to try to be successful and, and it worked, um, it worked well. So that, that would be my, my experience. Uh, wow. That's, uh, that's very valuable. I think for both of you and uh, you know, what's definitely coming through is, is really understanding, you know, the specific value that you can bring to the company and then how you kind of articulate that in the, in the, in the interview, um, uh, you know, Tina, Building on that, you know, anything that you, you kind of agree or disagree with that and, and also kind of maybe share a little bit about your, your own experience with, uh, with CastBox. Uh, well, my, my experience um, is uh, very similar to, to what uh, my colleagues just described. Um, I knew what I wanted more or less from the very beginning and uh, I actually try to use all the resources that we had at SEEPS. So we, uh, I think what is really helpful is that SEEPS is doing this career tracks and um, uh, also the modules in different cities. So I used the chance and uh, during this visits, I met a lot of companies such as Xiaomi, such as 
Tencent, Huawei, those. Um, so I wanted to uh, be in a tech company, but at the same time, I wanted to do something around media and around content. So I really used all the opportunities. And eventually, uh, similarly to Gulnara, I, uh, I went to, I, I was also attending a lot of exhibitions and eventually I went to a huge event called Slash in Shanghai, which is a tech, uh, tech exhibition where startups present to investors. And I met Castbox there, uh, I met Castbox team. And I was uh, really interested in the product. And I was like, oh, can I talk to you? Uh, can I talk to the founder, please? And then I realized that actually the founder is uh, Steve's graduate. So uh, Renee Wang uh, in Chinese, Wang Xiaoyu, she, is, uh, she went through an entrepreneurship program. Uh, it's a different from our MBA, but it's really, you know, helped us to find a connection because it really helps to feel that we belong to the same institution. So a uh, couple of days after the that slash fair, uh, Renee came to Steve's to uh, speak at the females uh, leadership forum and we met there. So I didn't really have to go anywhere. So we met there, we spoke and yeah, after that, uh, well, the role didn't exist at that time. So um, I was doing uh, really similar things. I was trying to emphasize on which value I can bring to the company. So I had my previous experience in the media industry. Previously, I lived and worked in Europe. So I had very good understanding. I had my personal connections that uh, were uh, interesting for for Castbox, and then um, I went through uh, many interviews after that. And uh, the funny thing, when I had an interview with HR, HR was, "Oh, you are in China for two years. You studied uh, in Chinese business school. That's really helpful. So you will survive." Um, yeah. So that's my experience. And uh, for the tips. Um, yeah, I think we cannot uh, compete uh, with the Chinese peers. Obviously, the uh, the value that we add to the companies is really like our knowledge, our previous experience, our previous knowledge of uh, other other regions. Wonderful, thank you, uh, Tina and and Lawrence. Uh, you know, a little bit about uh, about your experience. I think you've graduated most recently, so it should be very fresh for you, right? Yeah, I, I graduated right into the coronavirus crisis. So <laughs> it's a very exceptional uh, sort of experience. And I think the rest of the experience that you can have here in the panel, they are more valuable for the for the new intakes than mine. Um, I think there was a good portion of luck in, in the coronavirus. There are some industries that were heavily hit and some that were uh, not so much hit. So it's somewhat, you know, imagine you work in, in hospitality or travel. I suppose you've had a very tough time, whereas if you work in pharma or, or something like this, then you are better off. So this is not really, I mean, the, the, our batch is not really representative in that way. Um, but I do want to underline the point that, that you just have to make sure it doesn't matter when you apply, you have to be a fit for the company. And that's really important that it's not an application, it's not really a, a wish or a dream that you have that you can just say, okay, I'm, I'm gonna become, I don't know, the next, uh, make a crazy jump or something like that, do something completely new you have to make sure that you are somewhat a value add for the company and that you work for the company in, in sort of that you are a match. Um, that's something really important, I think. And therefore you can also, I don't personally believe that it's so important that you, um, what kind of way you get into the company, uh, a standard application process does the job. If you are a good fit to the company and you can, you can show that you are adding value to the company um, then you can do it uh, through pretty much any channel because in the MBA journey, you will have a lot of opportunities where you can network with people. Uh, you have the mentoring program. Um, there's all sorts of activities and stuff where you can actually, uh, and in their career fairs, there are, um, there are China modules where you work on real cases with businesses in China. Um, so you do have a lot of opportunity. But in the end of the day, what counts is um, yeah, your skills and whether you are a fit for the company. 
um, I think that's a really important point to mention. Thanks, Lawrence. That also kind of brings us really nicely onto the, the next question. And, it, you know, I completely agree. You know, we see it all the time. It seems this, you know, this this fit with the company. You know, it is something that's that's very important. It's also something that's, you know, I guess a little bit difficult to, you know, to measure or, you know, or understand at, a, at an interview. You know, also something that I guess for some people, it's not so natural to articulate, you know, kind of that that fit with the company. Um, Gulnara, I'd like to know from you if that's okay, if you could talk a little bit about the the, the company culture, either at Jinko or at a uh, current company at Long E Solar. Um, how is it, you know, different, say, in, in, in Europe compared to it is, you know, in, in China? Um, you know, maybe, so maybe from that respect, you could talk a little bit more about, about Jinko. Okay, sure. <clears throat> so, uh, corporate fit is extremely, a uh, cultural fit. I would not uh, call it a corporate fit, but rather cultural fit extremely important. And in fact, just today, I turned down one of uh, the candidates uh, for a sales position simply because competence-wise, he was 100%, but I know he's not going to last. Okay, so because uh, previously, this person did not have uh, experience working for an Asian company, not even specifically Chinese, but Asian company, and it requires a different skill. It requires a different agility, flexibility, and tolerance. Okay, so that's why I knew that, you know, it's not going to work. He would have worked uh, well in European or American company, but not with the Chinese company. So um, cultural fit, I mean, um, uh, well, uh, Jinko was very different because the company grew and our identity has been extremely influenced by successes outside of China. Because at that time in my industry, in photovoltaic and solar photovoltaic industry, the, the biggest markets actually started outside of China. So that's why those successes have defined how the company is. Uh, and now, uh, so the company was, uh, Jinko is a very, let's say, uh, very globalized, uh, very international, uh, et cetera. Many other executives joined me afterwards uh, and the company was quite open. Yet when I came to uh, Longji, uh, which is, um, I mean, they were upstream manufacturers, so we're, uh, they, they were in B2B sales, but uh, primarily um, focus on the China market, okay? And they built their fortunes in China. And that defined the culture of the company uh, uh, very much. Plus also the uh, headquarters of the company is in Xi'an, so it's in the center of China. Uh, it's not Shanghai, it's not Beijing, so it's a bit more, um, you know, it's not your, uh, let's say, tier one city. So, and it's uh, very, very different because then obviously there is a strong corporate culture, uh, which is also a national culture. And given the fact that, uh, you know, when I was with Jinko, I was joining 3,000 employee company, and now I joined 60,000 people company, who has been already, you know, a very strong player uh, in, um, in China, that was, uh, that was quite different. But however, you know, uh, uh, we will see more and more companies going global. And in fact, uh, when I was being interviewed actually by Longji, they told me that my biggest, let's say advantage, apart from, of course, I'm coming from the industry, I was holding similar roles in the other uh, regions, et cetera. But my biggest plus was that I lived in China and I worked for Chinese company before, okay? And actually, if I was not going to SIBS before, if I didn't live in China previously for two years, uh, work, you know, uh, mingling with uh, um, yeah, my uh, fellow classmates in uh, China, etc., and, you know, sometimes there were conflicts, but we were working out uh, through these conflicts because of, uh, because of the cultural differences, I think, I don't think I would have survived, okay? Um, because I was coming from the American corporate, uh, corporate culture, which is very blunt, straightforward, et cetera. So that's why I had to adjust myself quite a bit. And uh, that, you know, that uh, also, I think also moving forward, for example, if uh, you are to go to SIPs, if you are to work in the uh, Chinese company, whether in China or outside of China, but it's going to be a huge asset, even if you go back to your home country or elsewhere, because that experience with China will be ever uh, increasingly important, of course, and simply even if you're new to the industry, for example, but that would be your value added uh, to, you know, to this, because again, um, when you work, I mean, cultural fit is important. Um, uh, Western, Westerners tend to be obviously very straightforward, etc. cetera. Uh, however, you need to uh, learn how to be diplomatic. You need to learn how to listen. You need to learn how to not criticize other people in public, etc. And it will go a long way 
Uh, and that's one of the, I would say that one of the, that's one of the success factors of not only surviving, but I believe thriving in the Chinese enterprise. That's uh, some fantastic takeaways. Thank you, uh, Golnara, for, for, for that. Uh, Diego, I'm sure a lot that you'd uh, agree with there, but, uh, you know, how is it, how is it with uh, Alibaba or Ant Financial in, uh, you know, say in, in, uh, in, in Spain or in Europe compared to, to back in Shanghai or Hangzhou? Uh, I would say, again, the, the experience in Seeds was super useful uh, to get ready for that because you work in three to two ratio teams, right, for this uh, casework, which is the base of MBA, right, working in groups to solve these cases. So you do get to understand half of it already in the classroom and, and make half of the mistakes that you would otherwise do at work. So, yeah, th th that was very useful with regards to cultural differences between the European uh, Southeast Asian and, and Chinese offices of Alibaba, it's quite similar. I think that the number of employees overseas is still very small. We have something called homecoming. So everybody tends to go to, to Hangzhou at least once per year, if not more, um, to, to gather for annual events. And so, uh, and we have a lot of webcasts with headquarters. Teams are really mixed between say Europe and, and, and China, there's always multifunctional teams going around. So I would say that the culture is very similar. Um, it doesn't really change that much. Of course, there's some cultural nuances, uh, but we don't do siesta in the Spain office, if that's what you're asking. We don't sleep uh, for prolonged periods, although we do in China a bit, so, so that's quite a similar thing, but um, it, it's, not, it's not that, that big of, um, of a group of people for, the, for it to allow to create a, a completely parallel uh, parallel culture. Additionally, we have something called organizational culture team at Alibaba, which is a part of HR. And it really uh, shares success and stories from different offices across different teams. So you really always get to know what's going on. And there's a bunch of activities and interest groups and stuff. So I think that there's such a matrix approach that you don't really, there's not that much of a difference um, in, in that. I think one thing that, that really sort of surprised me was the KPI mindset, the, the target mindset, right? This, this numerical sort of targets that you have to hit. And, and I think we're moving away slightly from that, but it is quite aggressive, right? That there is quite a sort of every six months you, you have to deliver stuff and it gets reviewed. And, and you know, you, you have to try to not take things personal because, you know, I would say half of the projects that I worked on got cut. Uh, because we didn't deliver what we had to deliver. And a lot of people take it personally, you know, they, they think, oh, the management is so unfair and so demanding and, and maybe they ignore some factors we're close to. But, you know, it, it is what it is. And, and I think it, it, it's a good thing. I think that really has a fresh, every day is fresh in, in, in companies like this because you, you get an opportunity to also try new things. And I think another thing that I really like is, is they always let you try stuff in a small scale. So you don't need to prove months of research and strategic reports and analysis to do something small. It's okay to try. You won't get much resources to try, but if you get some initial traction, then they'll put a team budget and, and whatever you need behind you. So I think that, that, that's pretty interesting. I think it's also a personality thing, right? I, I, it really suits me. I really enjoy that. Other people prefer to have a more structured sort of super long-term uh, view of things but um but yeah i think uh, it does bring in a lot of uh, flexibility so um yeah my favorite uh, sort of on, um, internal motto is today's best performance is tomorrow's baseline which uh, kind of creates this hunger dynamism inside that you know everyone's willing to help you if you have a new idea to do something and i think that that's that's pretty that's pretty cool yeah Excellent, thank you, Diego. I may well steal that uh, and use that in future presentations. So thanks for that that soundbite. Um, uh, Tina, you're also in a you know in a, in a market development or a BD role for, for Castbox. You know, is it similar in terms of KPIs? Maybe you can kind of elaborate on you know some of the cultural differences uh, you know with them in Beijing versus overseas. Yeah, I, I want to start with the, the just to tell you a little bit more about Castbox. So we are a pretty unique case. We are a company that was born global. So we don't have any business in China. We don't operate in China because we are an open platform. We are blocked in China the same way as Facebook or WhatsApp or uh, many other Western platforms. So when uh, we started, uh, we 
immediately started, uh, you know, working uh, overseas, uh, focusing on the North America, and later on, we grew a lot in Europe and also in such countries as Brazil and Mexico. So um, yeah, and um, we are very little company still. We are still a startup uh, with a very talented team of engineers. All our engineers and support team, uh, customer service, they are uh, all based in Beijing. Um, I would say my Chinese colleagues, like really um, many of them are very internationalized. So it was really helpful for me to blend in because they are exposed to Western culture, obviously, because all our partners and clients, they are all in the West. So historically, you know, the team acquired this knowledge. And when I joined, it was to some extent, it was easier than joining uh, like local Chinese company. But also, you know, there, is, there are so many, uh, so many um, things in culture wise, you know, uh, schedule wise. So for example, we have very different uh, calendar. So right now, you know, all the Chinese colleagues are uh, on holidays, but we are working because uh, it's a high season in the US. Um, I spent um, a lot of time uh, with working from the Beijing office and it was a great experience. Uh, I learned to take a nap after, after the lunch. So, yeah, and um, yeah, I would say the being, um, I work uh, to some extent as a bridge still, you know, bridging the, uh, it's not, it's, it's not uh, so, so evident, but uh, yeah, we still have some tiny things uh, in communication that are different between China and the West, such as we use different uh, emoji uh, we use, you know, different ways to um, to celebrate, you know, to celebrate different achievements. So yeah, th these are tiny things. And uh, bridging this back to my experience uh, at Steve's, I was lucky enough to be a team leader for a couple of projects. I was a team lead for ICSP, which is uh, our uh, biggest consulting project. And I had a team of uh, Chinese and yeah, it was a good learning. So you learn that um, you cannot uh, show your emotions. You cannot be, um, well, you have to, you have to, you have to really uh, manage. You have to learn uh, how to, how to manage that because um, yeah, Western cultures are much more, much more direct. Excellent, thank you, thank you, Tina and uh, Lawrence. Uh, any any uh, post afternoon naps uh, that you can report? <laughs> no, I mean it is the afternoon. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but um, surely, I mean, for CATL, the company that I work for, um, we're very proud of our heritage, right? We are in our vision statement. We say we are a deeply rooted Chinese company, and we are embracing global culture. So it's somewhat, you know, cultural wise. You see that. A lot of Chinese um, colleagues we have, um, but we do embrace global culture because our customer base mainly is overseas. And um, I mean, CATL is a fairly young company in the automotive industry. If you compare it to most other companies, we've been established in uh, 2011, so 10 years ago. And um, we also uh, gradually or naturally grown into this uh, global role. We, we had major customers in in Europe, and that's how we, we really gained traction as a company. And this exponential growth that uh, CATL has achieved over the years is also due to this, that we are kind of global from day one. Um, and you kind of feel this in the culture. So um, especially the, the role that I have in Germany, making kind of this bridge between a deeply rooted Chinese company to our German and European customers. Um, you have a lot of colleagues that are fantastic English speakers um, that are, have a very global mindset and uh, you really feel this kind of uh, innovative mindset that's actually some of our core values to, to thrive, work hard, 
um, and innovate. That's that's really important. That's the ATL, and um, that's uh, that's that you kind of feel. And this making this kind of bridge um, that you were alluding to. This is um, for me. This this probably wouldn't have been possible without Seeds because I didn't know anything about China before. And you learn about this uh, during your MBA studies. So um, I highly encourage not only to uh, to to you know, listen to your courseworks and uh, do your studies. Also embrace Chinese culture outside of the classroom, socialize, um, experience the city. And that's actually the very valuable part for, for working in a, in a global company like that and making the best out of the corp um, corporate culture. Excellent. Thank you, Lawrence. Uh, that, that's, uh, that, that's great. Um, you know, my final question to you all was going to be about kind of the, you know, how SEEDS helped you to prepare for the role. But I think actually we've kind of talked about that throughout. So I'm going to skip on to the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the audience questions. So again, if anybody has any questions, please put them in the Q&A box and then we'll try and get through uh, as many as we can. Um, I'm going to do these a little bit out of order because I know that um, Gulnara, you, you may have to log off a little bit early. Um, so Jaron had a, a question uh, for you. And I think, you know, what, what, uh, what Jaron's trying to get at is, um, you know, in terms of if you had to make any you know, kind of um, any large efforts or consistent efforts to, to kind of fit in with the, with the, the Chinese culture at, uh, at Jinko when you first started there? Um, you know, if, if you had to kind of you know, make any big changes or you felt you already had adapted from your time at Seeds by that point, uh, maybe if you can just share a little bit about that. Well, as I said, uh, I mean, Seeds was a great uh, prep school uh, in that regard, right? So. Uh, Working on the project with my uh, classmates uh, has uh, taught me a great deal. One thing what I would do differently if I had, if I could go back, okay, because I would have mingled more with Chinese classmates uh, because we tend to click to someone who are similar to us. So that's why maybe things have changed since I studied. It was 12 years ago, but it was still like, for example, okay, we do some uh, activities, but however, the groups, the friendships are formed mainly with people, for example, Westerns with Westerns, Koreans with Koreans, Chinese with Chinese, et cetera. And sometimes there are some overlaps. So it's important to really, I mean, um, uh, make this effort since the beginning, okay? And get step out of your comfort zone and learn because that's going to really accelerate your integration into the country as well. So I wish I could have done this more. Uh, however, the long lasting friendships have been established. And every time I go back, Pre-COVID, I was going back maybe uh, four or five times a year. So, and uh, always catching up with my uh, classmates uh, in Shanghai. So, yeah, so it was not that different, but because of SIPs. If I was stepping off the boat directly into the Chinese company, I don't think it would have ended up so well. <laughs> Interesting, and, and as you say, in, in terms of uh, you know going from survival to, to thriving at the the company, right? It sounds quite quite important. That's uh, that's great, uh, Gulnari. If you need to log off earlier, then then feel free. But thank you very much for for joining us. Uh, thank this, uh, James. I just wanted to, because I think I wanted to add a couple of things which may be sure. relevant to the audience as well. So um, one thing, guys, if you are actually, uh, if you are hired somewhere else and not in China, you're hired for the Chinese company, it's really recommended if you can maybe spend some time in China, ideally maybe three months, six months, stay in the headquarters, learn everyone from the receptionist all the way to the top. It's going to go a long way. If you're not able to do that, come back. Go back at least once a quarter. It's extremely, extremely important to create these bonds because, as I said, that's what I was doing in Jinko, and now with Longji, I have no, actually, uh, I have no cho uh, no chance to go back, and it's very, very difficult. Although there are a lot of uh, uh, phone calls, a lot of video conferences, but it's very different. So I really miss this physical con uh, contact, and uh, as soon as it's possible, I'm going to go back. And um, last thing I wanted to mention as well is that probably it's more for women. Um, I never felt discriminated by the Chinese company. Also because in the Western world, for example, if you have kids or you are about to have kids in Europe, your career is over or no one wants to hire you. Ah, she has small kids. No, 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 she's gonna take some time off. I have two young kids, okay? So the company gave me this opportunity 
to actually work hard and it's a very fast paced very result oriented company but at the same time i was still was able to uh, become a mother of uh, two young children and i was able to do that and no one discriminated me uh, based on that whether it's uh, salary whether it's equal opportunity for growth or anything else and that's i'm very very grateful for this and i'm experiencing the same thing actually in longji that there is no let's say discrimination based on gender yeah, on gender Wonderful. Thank you, Gunnar, and, and for those uh, those final two points. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on the on the on the panel. I really appreciate you giving up your time over lunch to to, to join us. Um, I'm just going to kind of rifle uh, through these. I think uh, next actually it's a question for, for me and Marianne um, from from Jefferson Perez. Uh, so I'm currently working in Shanghai, originally from the Philippines. Do you accept student applications under work permit? I'm planning to pursue further education while studying. Uh, so sadly, Jefferson, for the full time MBA program, uh, we will need to have you on a student visa, um, and uh, it's not something that you can balance with with work. It's it's really full time for a reason. Uh, definitely. In term one and term two some people are working you know you know to the, the early hours of morning on group assignments so uh, it's definitely something that requires you to uh, you know give up your job uh, at least for the say for the minimum of 12 months and then you can do the the fast track uh, 12 month program um, that's my part done uh, Morgan uh, has a question for Diego um, about Chinese tech companies and how they are um, integrating the international employees into their core operations and cultures. So he's specifically asking, are the international development teams integrated to the company or do they operate fairly independently within the company? It's a good, good, good question. I also applied to the Samsung Global Strategy uh, LDP leadership program. Um, and, and, you know, I, I, I didn't submit my application eventually because it was like a SWAT team of foreigners. So it's like this suite of people getting paid $150,000 to sit in a room in Seoul all day to, to come up with great PowerPoints. And, and I think this is a really good question because I think Chinese companies, from my limited experience, don't seem to, to act like that. Um, and Alibaba, for sure not. So we were uh, 33 foreigners in the first batch. In my batch, it was 20 of us. I, I never really worked with any of the other foreigners um, at any point uh, during during my work. So we were all split out, but not forcefully split out. It was just trying to put everyone on the place where they had expertise uh, from a geographical or, or from an um, industry point of view. So I think that that is really good. Uh, again, like Gulnara mentioned for the MBA, it's what you make of it. So I think it's your responsibility to go to lunch with your team, to go to lunch with Chinese uh, people that you play basketball with, to go uh, visit their hometown uh, when they invite you for the May holiday, um, instead of going you know, to Hong Kong uh, to meet your foreign friends, right? So I think it is, it, I think that it, it's your decision. So I would say, you know, try to learn as much of the language um, as possible, try to participate in, in activities, try to, you know, adapt yourself. Don't expect other people to adapt because that, that, that you know, um, it, it, it's, it's hard to, to be satisfied um, otherwise. Because I think if we're in a new country, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, better to try to adapt, but also try to see what you can bring to the table, right? If, if you know, they, I, I was teaching English, right, to developers uh, once a week uh, for the first two years, right? Because they, they really wanted to, get a grasp of, of some technical language. Um, and at the beginning, a lot of foreigners were like, wow, I'm overqualified to, to teach English. You know, why, why should I do that? But I think sometimes you being humble in that way offers you things that you could never get access to. These people will invite you to their hometown. They will, you know, work for you until 3 a.m. when your project gets stuck if, if, if you need to, and, and they'll help you out and, and, and show you things about how decisions are made that you maybe don't understand. So I think you need friends and I think investing in that is very valuable uh, and the company will never sort of segregate you and put you in like a foreign team. Um, yeah, that, that's my view. 
Wonderful, thank you, thank you, Diego. Um, next, we've got a, a whole barrel of questions from David in uh, in Italy. Um, David, if it's okay, I'm going to pick out you know just a, a couple of these that I think are you know are quite uh, quite 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 interesting. Um, so the the first one would be if the panel can just clarify if they found their first job after graduation through Sieb's resources or connections, or it was something that was, uh, you know, that you found on your own. I, I think probably the answer is going to be a combination of the both, but uh, maybe uh, Lawrence, we'll start with you, then we'll go Valentina and then Diego, if that's okay. Sure. I think the general answer here is that you, you definitely have the opportunity to get your jobs through the CDC. That's the, um, Career Council, basically. Um, there's, um, there's many ways you can get your job. Uh, I personally believe, as I said earlier, the standard application process is the best way to go with, because that way you find out whether you're an actual fit or not. Yeah. Okay. I'll keep it brief so the rest can say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Lawrence. Uh, Tina. Well, I think uh, the opportunity can actually uh, come from all, any of the resources. And uh, I spend a lot of time with the CDC consultants and I um, I uh, had meetings on a regular basis with a few of them to, uh, to just emphasize uh, on the career path that I'm interested in uh, to check out if they have any updates for me. And actually I got a consulting project from a CDC consultant and that consulting project, uh, which is irrelevant to my uh, full-time job. And it was uh, when I was at the end of my first year and that consulting project helped me, you know, because uh, we are all students, we cannot work uh, full-time. So that opportunity was really helpful for the time being. Uh, but later, yeah, as I mentioned, I uh, it was not directly, uh, you know, the uh, opportunity came not directly from the uh, SEEPS resources, but SEEPS connections really helped me to build this um, meaningful, meaningful connection between me and the team. Great. Thank you, Tina. And Diego? I think that you are the project manager, right? So, uh, and actually, David is my colleague from Alipay. <laughs> so we used to work together before. Um, so, so I think you are the project manager, right? You have to be the owner. The, the job is listed in the SIBS portal, perhaps, or the company comes to the, to the, to the campus or you visit the company uh, with a SIBS trip and the alumni can write the application for you, right? But you have to be the owner of that. Otherwise, it doesn't happen. So, you know, my mentor, for example, found me a job, which was something that I was not very interested in, right? So you, you have to take decisions. And, and I think the satisfaction, the happiness, and the, the amount of years that you stay with the job after MBA depend on, on how active you are. So nobody is going gonna, is gonna to really manage your, your career at SIPS or at any business school. So you have to be pushing, you know, uh, well, people like James, people like the career service, people like the student committee to, 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 to know what is going on, to see what opportunities are there, to see how you can get involved, to, to get more context. And I think, you know, that, 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 that's, the, um, that's the thing. And there are companies that are SIBS Mafia, like AstraZeneca. I mean, the, the, the CEO for China, like five out, five out of 10 MDs are, are, are from SIBS, right? But there's other companies like Alibaba that are not very sort of, well, now, now they're becoming more SIBS heavy, but not necessarily. So I think it also depends on, 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 on the industry. And I think those areas where you have to be a subject expert, uh, professors can be a great tool. So some of my classmates did research um, support to, to a couple of our professors. And that really advanced them in, in getting um, functional expertise in an area that is quite hard to get if you don't have it before and if, you know, you don't have a specific education. So I think that the resources are there, but you, you have to be active. In that sense, the, the, the key principle for me is uh, study, study less and uh, focus more on, 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 on your career, uh, so to say. I don't know if James approves of that comment. 
Yeah, I, I'm fine. But if the, if the uh, if the NBA director was listening, then I would wholeheartedly disagree with you. Um, but uh, <laughs> thank you also, Diego, for giving me Seeb's Mafia as a, another soundbite that I will use in, in future webinars. Mm -hmm. um, the next point from David then was quite interesting in terms of, you know, you're all kind of working for Chinese companies that have gone global. In general, at, at your respective companies, are they supportive of you kind of, you know, going overseas or do they, you know, do they have this kind of thing that you, you work there for so many years and then they, they farm you out? You know, typically what does that process look at, look like? And maybe Tina, we start with you, if that's okay. Right. When I joined uh, CastBox, we were um, launching a new feature. Actually, the product was um, at the development stage at that time. So we were like really uh, working long hours and we had to uh, to market the new technology. And when I joined, my particular uh, responsibility was to uh, find early adopters for the our new feature. Um, we had to uh, find podcasters that were willing to test the new feature and we were uh, collecting feedback. So those, um, those podcasters were from second tier markets uh, such as, um, let's say, India, New Zealand, uh, South Korea. So we had uh, a really, you know, bunch of these uh, markets that are... Um, growing for for castbox and then yeah my my role was to to reach out to people and to really uh structure the feedback collection and then um uh, talk to our engineers and see how we can reiterate all this feedback that we are gathering from the market into the new feature and how this feature has to evolve so yeah, that was, uh, you know, that was really, um, really challenging part. And uh, yeah, I think that was uh, for company that was essential that they need, you know, someone who can serve as the liaison between these two parts. Wonderful. Thank you, Tina. And, and Lawrence? Yeah, I think the, the point about relocation, I think, um, for me, you know, I, I, um, I basically work at CATS since the travel ban <laughs> has uh, kind of been effective. So um, I can't really speak for that. But in general, you know, as um, at CATL, the, the main business, um, it's a manufacturing company, is in our headquarter in Ningde in Fujian province. And um, there's usually a lot of opportunities to, um, to see the headquarters and go there. And uh, depending on the kind of role you have, what function it is, it makes sense that you relocate. Um, I would say if you are, um, yeah, it, it strongly depends. I have a lot of customer interaction in Germany. Therefore, for me, it's um, basically was clear from the start that I'm in, located in Germany. Um, yeah, but I could say, I, I would probably assume that most, um, most likely it depends on the role that you have. Um, and if you, for instance, are going for something like a leadership program, right, that we heard before from Diego, this is something I typically, I think people relocate a lot. Um, yeah, but for my case, I think there's not really a relocation so far. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna come back to the panel to ask for your kind of closing uh, words, if you have any kind of one final piece of uh, golden advice uh, for the audience today. Um, just some housekeeping from my side. So a couple of questions. Uh, is it possible to complete a BA in international economics and then go to an MBA? Um, anonymous attendee, that's absolutely fine, uh, providing that you have a minimum of two years work experience to join our MBA at Siebes. Uh, and then Rahil um, asked how to get admission uh, as a foreigner in China, if that's to join the MBA program. Um, then as Marianne shared in the, in the previous slide, uh, we require a minimum of a bachelor degree, a minimum of two years work experience and then um, uh, either a GMAT test score or a GRE or we have our own SEEBS admission test that we do in China. Um, this brings me nicely on to say that we'll have our fifth and final um, deadline to join the MBA program kicking off in October 21, 2021 and that deadline is the 2nd of June. Uh, what I'm going to do is in the chat box I'm going to write my, um, if I can do this, I'm going to write my WeChat and 
please feel free to add me uh, here uh, if you have any any further questions. Um, but thank you very much for, for joining everybody. Um, maybe just kind of final final panel comments and I'll pass over to, to, to Marianne. So maybe Diego, starting with you, if any kind of one final piece of golden advice for the audience tonight. Um, I think uh, well, if 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 you're jo if you're joining the, the, the program, I, I really recommend uh, studying Mandarin. So if you can do that before the program starts, either uh, in in the country where you're at, or you know even coming a few months uh, before, perhaps if you come to China, Mandarin is is a huge tool. Again, as as uh, some of the um, of, of the folks have said in the panel, it really. Um, you know, does help uh, breaking the ice and, you know, you can go from zero to uh, level three of HSK or, you know, you can go to level six if you're already in level three or whatever it is. But, you know, making that progress will really make you uh, successful, right? Because it, it'll open a ton of doors that I think uh, that, that are available for you, be it uh, with classmates um, of, of, you know, other MBA programs in Shanghai that, that are not in English that you connect with in different abilities be with our huge alumni uh, cohort uh, from MBA and from EMBA uh, that are there to, to give you resources um, and things like that so Mandarin is definitely more important than your than your GPA from my humble point of view and I think once you're there visiting China is is really important so you know it, it, it's hard obviously like there's assignments there's homework and stuff but you know try to make a point of visit five, six, seven provinces uh, in your first year there. Try to, you know, live with Chinese housemates or, or, or you know, uh, spend as much time, you know, having meals and, 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 and you know, spending time out of class with um, Chinese classmates as well. Um, try to get involved in as many activities as you can, uh, be it the student committee, be it, you know, these uh, consulting projects, whatever it is, try to get exposure because that's sometimes the only way to, to actually, you know, get understanding uh, and then maybe start a business. Um, this is not for everyone, but, you know, I, I mm, sort of try to, to leverage that e-lab that Marianne was talking about before. It's an incubator and accelerator, which are really competitive to get in uh, normally uh, out there. But, you know, being at the NBA gives you that opportunity to get a, um, a sort of higher chance to, to get a spot there. It doesn't have to be a huge thing. One of my classmates started a smart gym, for example, that is doing really well um, through the pandemic. Uh, I was trying to start a, a travel business that, that then failed, but now I've kept a, as a small side, side, side thing that I do. And, and you know, the, the relationships that you form with your co-founders and with investors are, are invaluable. So yeah, I definitely that, that would be uh, the, the recommendations. Yeah, be local and, uh, and uh, do as much as you can of different experiences. Excellent. Uh, Lawrence, I'm going to come to you next. Final thoughts. I think, you know, one of the um, important advices is in your MBA journey, um, do take advantage of all the resources. Um, something we haven't talked about in the, or we didn't have time to talk about is the case studies. I think there are many extracurricular case studies or, or case competitions, sorry, that you could participate in. I personally enjoy those. You can go to travel places um, and do this kind of stuff. Um, and I think finally, overall, most applicants, they are really stressed about their decision. I think you need to personally take out some of that pressure. It's not that complicated as don't over-engineer your decision. Um, so that's the last piece of advice I would give. Don't over-engineer, don't over-complicate things. Yeah, you're, you're going to be good off. Great. Thank you, Lawrence. And Tina, over to you. So I totally agree with uh, what uh, guys just mentioned, uh, the blending into Chinese culture and learning the language and traveling across the country is really important. But in terms of the program, I would say, um, I would recommend to uh, split it into two parts uh, from the very beginning, try to explore uh, and try to uh, participate in as many activities as possible. But later on, you have to focus. You have to uh, pick what you like. You have to pick the industry that you're interested in. You have to uh, you know, make a decision whether you want to be employed with Chinese company that is uh, going overseas or you want to be employed with an with a international company. And then you have to focus. If it's a Chinese company, you really need to focus on learning the language, 
understanding the culture if it's an uh, international company it's, it's something else and also if you um, if you are changing the industry the industrial knowledge is uh, really important so focus 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 and yeah this will eventually lead you to a uh, start of a successful career excellent uh, thank you very much uh, to a wonderful panel uh, Marianne over to, over to you Thank you all so much for joining today. Also, thank you a lot to our alumni here today. Lawrence, Diego, Tina, and Gunnar already left us. Thank you so much for sharing the experience. It was really great to have these insights. To our attendees today, um, we have posted our email addresses in the chat to all of you. But like also James did, feel free to contact us through WeChat. And for any questions we haven't had the time to answer right now, we will send you a follow-up email with all the resolutions to those. Thank you all once again, and I wish you a good afternoon or a good evening, whatever time zone you're in.